brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. For today, the last Saturday of the liturgical year, I have for you something that is appropriate, I think, to closing out the month of November. In, in November, we are reminded of the so-called Reformation, the Protestant Revolt, really. And here I have for you something from Father Michael Mueller from the 19th century. He was a Catholic apologist and priest of his time, and he sought to correct the errors of the acolytes of Luther and Calvin and the rest. It's unpopular here today, and but note how different he sounds when he says what you're going to hear him say. There were priests who, a hundred years later, would say the same thing as him, and they got in severe trouble with the Vatican. Their names have become slurs, as if they were schismatics who started their own church. It's astonishing. But he never was censured for it. My father, Michael Mueller, was a hero of the faith. Something to think about here. Without further ado, The Great Revolt Against Christ by Father Michael Mueller From the beginning of the world there have been two elements, the good and the bad combating each other. There must be scandals, says our Lord. St. Michael and Lucifer combat each other in heaven, Cain and Abel in the family of Adam, Isaac and Ismael in the family of Abraham, Jacob and Esau in the family of Isaac, Joseph and his brethren in the family of Jacob, Solomon and Absalom in the family of David, St. Peter and Judas in the company of our Lord Jesus Christ, the apostles and the Roman emperors in the Church of Christ, St. Francis of Assisi and Brother Elias in the Franciscan order, St. Bernard and his uncle Andrew in the Cistercian order, St. Alphonsus and Father Legio in the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, Orthodox faith and heresy and infidelity in the kingdom of God on earth, the just and the wicked in all places, in fact, where is the country, the city, the village, the religious community, or the family, howsoever small it may be, in which these two elements are not found in opposition? The parable of the sower and the cockle is everywhere verified. Even should you be quite alone, grace and nature will combat each other. And a man's enemy shall they find in, of his own household. See Matthew chapter 10, verse 36. Strange to say, not only the good and the wicked are found in perpetual conflict, but God, for wise ends, permits that even the holiest and best of, of men are simul sometimes diametrically opposed to one another, and even incite persecution one against the other, though each one may be led by the purest and holiest of motives. There must be scandals, a fatal though divine warning. There must be storms in nature to purify the air from dangerous elements. In like manner, God permits storms, heresies to arise in his church on earth, in order that their erroneous and pious doctrines of heretics may, by way of contrast, set forth in clearer light the true and holy doctrines of the church. As light is in the midst of darkness, gold contrasted with lead, sun among the planets, the wise among the foolish, so is the Roman Catholic Church among non-Catholics. If two things are of different natures, says the wise man, be brought into opposition, the eye perceives their difference at once. Good is set against evil, and life against death. So also is the sinner against the just man, and so look upon all the works of the Most High, two and two and one against another. See Ecclesiasticus chapter 23, verse 15. Christ then permits the storm of heresies to burst upon his church in order to bring forth into clearer light his divine doctrine and to remove dangerous elements from his mystical body, the, Ca the Roman Catholic Church. At the beginning of the 16th century, with the exception of the Greek schismatics, a few law lords in England, some Waldenses in Piedmont, scattered Albigenses or Manichaeans, and a few followers of Huss and Ziska among the Bohemians, all Europe was Roman Catholic. England, Scotland, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Hungary, Poland, Holland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, every civilized nation, was in unity of the Catholic faith. Many of these nations were at the height of their power and prosperity. Portugal was pushing her discoveries beyond the Cape of Good Hope and forming Catholic settlements in the East Indies. The great explorer, a Roman Catholic, had discovered America under the patronage of the Catholic Isabella of Spain. England was in a state of great prosperity. Her two Catholic universities of Oxford and Cambridge contained, at one time, more than 50,000 students. The country was covered with noble churches, abbeys, and monasteries, and with houses where the poor were fed, clothed, and instructed. However, the progress of civilization tended to foster a spirit of pride and encourage the lust of novelties. 
prosperity of the church led to luxury, and in many cases to a relaxation of discipline. There were, as there have always been in every period of the church, the days of the apostles not accepted, bad men in the church. The wheat and tares grew together until the harvest. The net of the church encloses good and bad. The writings of Wycliffe, Huss, and their followers had unsettled the minds of many. Princes were restive under the check held by the church upon their rapacity and lusts. Henry VIII, for example, wanted to separate himself from his wife to whom he had been married twenty years, that he might marry a young and pretty one. He could not do this, so long as he acknowledged the spiritual supremacy of the Pope. Philip, Landgrave of Hesse, wanted two wives. No Pope would give him a dispensation to marry and live with two at the same time. Then there were multitudes of wicked and avarice nobles who wanted but an excuse to plunder the churches, abbeys, and monasteries, whose property was held in trust for the education of the people, and the care of the, a the poor, the aged, and those not well all over Europe. Then there were priests and monks eager to embrace a relaxed discipline, and many people who, incited by the cry of liberty, were ready to rush into license and make war upon every principle of religion and social order, as soon as circumstances would favor this release of this rebel spirit in individuals and masses. Now, when God, says St. Gregory, sees in the church many revealing their vices, and as St. Paul observes, believing in God, confessing the truth of his mystery, but belying their faith by their works, he punishes them by permitting that, after having lost grace, they also lose the holy knowledge which they had of his mysteries, and that, without any other persecution than that of their vices, they deny the faith. It is of these David speaks when he says, Reduce Jerusalem to its foundations. See Psalm chapter 86, verse 7. Leave not a stone upon a stone. When the wicked spirits have ruined in a soul the edifice of virtue, they sap its foundation, which is faith. St. Cyprian, therefore, said, Let no one think that virtuous men and good Christians ever leave the bosom of the church. It's not the weaf that the wind lifts, but the chaff. Trees deeply rooted are not blown down by the breeze, but those which have no roots. It is rotten fruits that fall off the trees, not sound ones. Bad Catholics become heretics, as, as this error is engendered by bad humors. At first, faith languishes in them because of their vices. Then it becomes not not solid. Then it, then it passes because sin is essentially a blindness of the spirit. The more a man sins, the more he is blinded. His faith grows weaker and weaker. The light of this divine torch decreases, and soon the least wind of temptation or doubt suffices to extinguish it. Witness the great defection from faith in the 16th century when God permitted heresies to arise in order to exercise his justice against those who are ready to abandon the truth, and his mercy towards those who remained attached to it, to prove by trials those who are firm in the faith, and to separate them from the, those who loved error to exercise the patience and charity of the church, and to sanctify those whose names were in the book of life, to give occasion for the illustration of religious truth in the Holy Scripture, to make pastors more vigilant and value more the sacred deposit of faith, in fine, to render the authority of tradition more clear and incontestable. Heresy arose in all its strength. Martin Luther was its ringleader and its spokesman. Martin Luther, an Augustinian friar, a bold man and a vehement declaimer, having imbibed erroneous sentiments from the heretical writings of John Huss of Bohemia, took occasion from the publication of indulgences promulgated by Pope Leo X to break with the Catholic Church and propagate his new errors in 1517 at Wittenberg in Saxony. He first inveighed against the, the misuse of indulgences, then he called in question their efficacy, and at last he totally rejected them. He declaimed against the supremacy of the See of Rome and condemned the whole Church, pretending that Christ had abandoned it and that it wanted reforming as well as in faith as in discipline. Thus, the new evangelists commenced that fatal defection from the ancient faith, which was styled quote-unquote Reformation. The new doctrines being calculated to gratify the various inclinations of the human heart spread with the rapidity of an inundation. Frederick, the head of Saxony, John Frederick, his successor, and Philip, Landgrave of Hesse, became Luther's disciples. Gustavus Ericus, king of Sweden, and Christian III, king of Denmark, also declared in favor of Lutheranism, secured a footing in Hungary. Poland, after tasting a great variety of doctrines, left to every individual the liberty of choosing for himself. Munzer, a disciple of Luther, set up himself as teacher, and with Nicholas Stark gave birth to the sect of the Anabaptists, which was propagated in Swabia and other provinces in Germany and in the Low Countries. Calvin, a man of bold, obstinate spirit and unwavering in his labors, in imitation of Luther, turned to reformer also. He contrived to have his new tenets received at Geneva in 1541. After his death, Beza preached the same doctrine. It insinuated itself in some parts of Germany, Hungary, Bohemia, and became the religion of Holland. It was imported by John Knox, an apostate priest, into Scotland, where, under the name of the Presbyterianisms, it took deep root and spread over the kingdom. But among the deluded nations, none drank more deeply the cup of error than England. 
For many centuries, this country had been conspicuous in the Christian world for the orthodoxy of its belief, but also for the number of its saints. But by a misfortune never to be sufficiently lamented, and by an unfathomable judgment from above, its church shared a fate which seemed the least to threaten it. The lust and avarice of one despotic sovereign threw down the, the fair edifice and tore it off the rock on which it had hitherto stood. Henry VIII, at first a valiant asserter of the Catholic faith against Luther, giving way to the violent passions which he had not sufficient courage to curb, renounced the supreme jurisdiction which the Pope had always held in the Church, presumed to arrogate to himself that power in his own dominions, and thus gave a deadly blow to religion. He then forced his subject into the same fatal defection. Once introduced, it soon overspread the land, being, from its nature, limited by no fixed principle. It has since taken a hundred different shapes, under different names, such as the Calvinists, Arminians, Antimonians, Independents, Kilomites, Glassites, Halidonites, Berians, Weborgians, New Jerusalemites, Orthodox Quakers, Hickesites, Shakers, Panthers, Seekers, Jumpers, Reform, Methodists, etc. All these sects are called Protestants because they are all united in protesting their mother, the Roman Catholic Church. Some time after, when the reforming spirit had reached its full growth, Dudithus, a learned Protestant divine, in his epistle to Beza wrote, What sort of people are our Protestants straggling to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, sometimes to this side, sometimes to that? You may perhaps know what their sentiments in matters of religion are today, but you can never tell precisely what they will be tomorrow. In what article of religion do these churches agree which have cast off the Bishop of Rome? Examine all from top to bottom, and you will scarce find one thing affirmed by one which was not immediately condemned by another for wicked doctrine. The same confusion of opinions was described by an English Protestant, the, the learned Dr. Walton, at the middle of the last century, in his preface to his polyglot, where he says, Aristarchus heretofore could scarcely find seven wise men in Greece, but with us scarce are to be found so many idiots. For all are teachers, all are divinely learned. There is not so much as the meanest fanatic who does not give you his own dreams for the word of God. The bottomless pit seems to have been opened, from whence a smoke has arisen which has darkened the heavens and the stars, and locusts have come out with stings, a numerous race of sectaries and heretics who have renewed all the ancient heresies and invented many monstrous opinions of their own. They have filled our cities, villages, camps, houses, and nay, our pulpits too, and lead the poor deluded people with them to the pit of perdition. Yes, writes another author, every ten years or nearly so, the Protestant theological literature undergoes a complete renovation. What was admired during the one decennial period is rejected in the next, and the image which they adored is burnt to make way for new divinities. The dogmas which were held in honor fall into discredit. The classical treatise of morality is banished among the old books out of date. Criticism overturns criticism. The commentary of yesterday ridicules that of the previous day, and that was clearly proved in 1840, is not less clearly disproved in 1850. The theological systems of Protestants are as numerous as the political constitutions of France. One renovation only awaits another. It is indeed utterly impossible to keep the various members of one single group from perpetual disputes, even among the essential truths of revealed religion. And those religious differences exist not only in the same group, but not only in the same country and town, but even in the same family. Nay, the same self, the self same individual at different periods of his life is often in flagrant contradiction with himself. Today he avows opinions which yesterday he abhorred. Tomorrow he will exchange these again for new ones. At last, after belonging successively to various newfangled groups, he generally ends by professing unmitigated contempt for them all. But continual disputes and bickerings in dividing and subdividing, the pro various Protestant groups have made themselves the scorn of honest minds, the laughing stock of the pagan and infidel. These human sects, the work of the flesh, as St. Paul calls them, alter their shape like clouds, but feel no blow, says Mr. Marshall, because they have no substance. They fight a good deal with one another, but nobody minds it, not even themselves nor cares what becomes of them. If one human group perishes, it is always easy to make another, or half a dozen. They have the life of worms and propagate by corruption. Their life is so like death that, except by putridity, which they exhale in both stages, it is impossible to tell which is which. And when they are buried, nobody can find their graves. They have simply disappeared. The spirit of Protestantism, or the spirit of rejecting God's truth in his church, sprung up from the reformer spirit of incontinency, obstinacy, and covetousness. Luther, in spite of the vow he had solemnly made to God of keeping continency, married a nun, equally bound as himself to that sacred religious promise. But, as St. Jerome says, it is rare to find a heretic that loves chastity. Luther's example had been indeed anticipated by Carlos Stantidius, a priest and ringleader of the Sacramentarians, who had married a little before, and it was soon followed by most of the heads of the Reformation. Zwinglius, a priest and chief of the sect that bore his name, took a wife. 
Bucher, a member of the Order of St. Dominic, became a Lutheran, left his cloister, and married a nun. Oclampadius, a Brigantine monk, became a Zwinglian and also married. Cramner, Archbishop of Canterbury, did the same. Peter Martyr, a canon regular, embraced the doctrine of Calvin, but followed the Luther example of Luther and, and also espoused a nun. Oaken, General of the Capuchins, became a Luther and followed suit. Thus, the principal leaders in the Reformation went forth preaching the new gospel, with two marks upon them, apostasy from faith and open violation of their most sacred vows. The passion of lust, as has already been said, hurried also Henry VIII of England into separation from the Catholic Church and ranked him among the reformers. These wicked men could not be expected to teach a holy doctrine. They preached up a hitherto unheard of evangelical liberty, as they styled it. They told their fellow men that they were no longer obliged to subject their understanding to the mysteries of faith and to regulate their actions according to the laws of Christian morality. They told that every one was free to model his belief and practice as it suited his inclinations. In pursuance of this accommodating doctrine, they dissected the Catholic faith till they reduced it to a mere skeleton. They lopped off the reality of the body and blood of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, the divine Christian sacrifice offered in the Mass, confession of sins, most of the sacraments, penitential exercises, several of the canonical books of Scripture, the invocation of saints, celibacy, most of the general councils of the Church, and all present Church authority. They twisted the nature of justification, asserting that faith alone suffices to justify man. They made God the author of sin and to maintain the observance of the commandments to be impossible. A few specimens of Luther's doctrine take the following. Quote, God's commandments are all equally impossible. No sins condemn a man, but only unbelief. God is just, though by his own will he lays us under the necessity of being damned, and though he damns those who have not deserved it. God works in us both good and evil. Christ's body is in every place, no less than the divinity itself. Then, for his darling principle of justification by faith, in his 11th article against Pope Leo, he says, quote, Believe strongly that you are absolved, and absolved you will be, whether you have contrition or not. Again, in his 6th article, The contrition which is required by examining, recollecting, and detesting one's sins, whereby a man calls to mind his past life and the bitterness of his soul, reflecting on the heinous a multitude of his offenses, loss of eternal bliss and condemnation to eternal woe, this contrition, I say, makes a man a hypocrite, nay, even a greater sinner than he was before. Thus, after the most immoral life, a man has compendious method of saving himself by simply believing that his sins are remitted through the merits of Christ. End quote. As Luther foresaw the scandal that would arise from his own and such like sacrilegious unions, he prepared the world for it by writing against the celibacy of the clergy and all religious vow, and all the way up since his time he had his imitators. He proclaimed that all such vows were contrary to faith, to the commandments of God, and to evangelical liberty. He said again, God disapproves of such a vow of living incontinency, equally as if I should vow to become the mother of God or to create a new world. And again, to attempt to live unmarried is plainly to fight against God. Now, when men give a loose rein to the depravity of nature, what wonder if the most scandalous practices ensue. Accordingly, a striking instance of this kind appeared in the license granted in 1539 to Philip, Landgrave of Hesse, to have two wives at once, which license was signed by Luther, Melanchthon, Bucher, and five other Protestant preachers. On the other hand, a wide door was laid open to another species of scandal. The doctrine of the Reformation admitted that the breaking of that which is unbreakable in certain cases, contrary to the doctrine of the gospel, and even allowed the par parties thus separated to take on new spouses and other husbands. To enumerate the error of all the reformers would exceed the limits of this treatise. I shall therefore only add the principal heads of the doctrine of Calvin and Calvinists. 1. That baptism is not necessary for salvation. 2. Good works are not necessary. 3. Man has no free will. 4. Adam could not avoid this, his fall. 5. A great part of mankind are created to be uh, damned independently of their demerits. 6. Man is justified by faith alone, and that justification, once obtained, cannot be lost, even by the most atrocious crimes. 7. The faithful are also infallibly certain of their salvation. 8. The Eucharist is no more than a figure of the body and blood of Christ. Thus the whole system of faith and morality overturned. Tradition they totally abolished. Though they could not reject the whole of Scripture as being universally acknowledged to be the Word of God, they had, however, the presumption to expunge some books of it that they did not coincide with their own opinions, and the rest they assumed a right to explain as they saw fit. To pious souls, they promised a return to the fervor of primitive Christianity, to the proud, the liberty of private judgment. To the enemies of the clergy, they promised the division of their spoils. To priests and monks who were tired of the yoke of continence, the abolition of a law which they said was contrary to nature to libertines of all classes, the suppression of fasting, abstinence, and confession. 
They said to kings who wished to place themselves at the head of the church as well as of the state, that they would be freed from the spiritual authority of the church. To nobles, they would be emancipated from all dues and forced services. Several princes of Germany of Swiss cantons supported by arms the preachers of the new doctrines. Henry VIII imposed his doctrine on his subjects. The king of Sweden drew his people into apostasy. The court of Nav Navarre welcomed the Calvinists. The court of France secretly favored them. At length, Pope Paul III convoked a general council at Trent in 1545, to which the heresiarchs had appealed. Not only had all the Catholic bishops, but also all Christian princes, even Protestants, were invited to come. But now the spirit of pride and obstinacy became most apparent. Henry VIII replied to the Pope that he would never entrust the work of reforming religion in his kingdom to anyone except to himself. The apostate princes of Germany were told the papal legate that they recognized only the emperor as their sovereign. The viceroy of Naples allowed but four bishops to go to the council. The king of France sent only three prelates, whom he soon after recalled. Charles V created difficulties and put obstacles in the way. Gustavus Vasa allowed no one to go to the council. The resiarchs also refused to appear. The council, however, was held in spite of these difficulties. It lasted over 18 years because it was often interrupted but by afflictions, by war, and by the deaths of those who had to preside over it. The doctrines of the innovators were examined and condemned by the council, at the last session of which there were more than 300 bishops present, among whom were nine cardinals, three patriarchs, 33 archbishops, not to mention 16 abbots or generals of religious orders, and 148 theologians. All the decrees published from the commencement were read over and were again approved and subscribed by the fathers. Accordingly, Pius IV, in a consistory held on the 26th of January in 1564, approved and confirmed the council in a book which was signed by all the cardinals. He drew up in the same year a profession of faith conformable in all respects with the definitions of the council, in which it is declared that it is that its authority is accepted, and since that time not only all bishops of the Catholic Church, but all priests who are called to teach the way of salvation, even to children, nay, all non-Catholics and abjuring their errors, returning to the bosom of the Church, have sworn that they had no other faith than that of the Holy Council. The new heresiarchs, however, continued to obscure and disfigure the face of religion. As to the Luther's sentiment in regard to the Pope, bishops, councils, etc., he said in the preface to his book De Obraganda Misa Privata, quote, With how many powerful remedies and most evident scriptures have I scarce been able to fortify my conscience so as to dare alone to contradict the Pope and to believe him to be Antichrist, the bishops, his, his apostles, and the universities, his brothel houses, end quote. And in his book De Judicio Ecclesia de Gravi Doctrina, he says, quote, Christ takes from the bishops, the teachers, and councils both the right and power of judging controversies and gives them to all Christians in general. End quote. His censure on the Council of Constance and those that compose it as follows quote, All John Huss's articles were condemned at Constance by Antichrist and his apostles, meaning the Pope and bishops in that synod of Satan made up of most wicked sof sophisters. And you, most holy vicar of Christ, I tell you plainly to your face that all John Huss's condemned doctrines are evangelical and Christian, but all yours are impious and diabolical. I now declare, he says he, speaking to the bishops, that for the future I will not vouchsafe you so much honor as to submit myself or doctrine to your judgment or that of an angel from heaven, end quote. Such was his spirit of pride that he made open profession of contempt for the authority of the church, councils and fathers, saying, Quote, all those who will venture their lives, their estates, their honor, and their blood. And so Krishna work is to root out all bishoprics and bishops who are the ministers of Satan and to pluck by the roots all their authority and jurisdiction in the world. These persons are the true children of God and obey his commandments. End quote. This spirit of pride and obstinacy is also most apparent from the fact that Protestantism has never been ashamed to make use of any arguments, though ever so frivolous and inconsistent or absurd to defend its errors and to slander and misrepresent the Catholic religion in every way possible. It shows itself again in the wars which Protestantism waged to introduce and maintain itself. The apostate princes of Germany entered into a league, offensive and defensive, against Emperor Charles V, and rose up in arms to establish Protestantism. Luther had preached licentiousness and reviled the emperor, the princes and the bishops. The peasants lost no time in freeing themselves from their masters. They overran the country in lawless bands, burned down castles and monasteries, and committed the most barbarous cruelties among the nobility and clergy. Germany became at last the scene of desolation and most cruel atrocities during the Thirty Years' War. More than 100,000 men fell in battle, seven cities were dismantled, 1,000 religious houses were razed to the ground. 300 churches and immense treasures of statuary, paintings, books, etc. were destroyed. 
But what is more apparent and better known than the spirit of covetousness of Protestantism? Whatever Protestantism secured a footing, it pillaged churches, seized church property, destroyed monasteries, and appropriated to itself their revenues. In France, the Calvinists destroyed 20,000 Catholic churches. They, they ended in Dauphiné alone 225 priests' lives, 112 monks, burned 900 towns and villages. In England, Henry VIII confiscated to the crown or distributed among his favorites the property of 645 monasteries and 90 colleges, 110 houses of workers, and 2,374 free chapels and chanteries. They even dared to profane with sacrilegious hands the remains of martyrs and confessors of God. In many places, they forcibly took up the saints' bodies from the repositories where they were kept, burned them, and scattered their ashes abroad. What more atrocious indignity can be conceived? Are parasites or the most flagitious men ever even worse treated? Among other instances, in 1562, the Calvinists broke open the shrine of St. Francis of Paula, a place least of the stores, and finding his body uncorrupted 55 years after his death, they dragged it about the streets and burned it in a fire which they had made with the wood of a large crucifix, as Belay and other historians relate. Thus, at Lyons, in the same year, the Calvinists seized upon the shrine of St. Bonaventure, stripped it of its riches, burned the saint's relics in the marketplace, and threw his ashes into the river Sion, as is related by the learned Posevinus, who was in Lyons at the time. The bodies also of St. Irenaeus, St. Hilary, St. Martin, as Suarez asserts, were treated in the same ignominious manner. Such also were the treatments offered by the remains of St. Thomas, Archbishop of Canterbury, whose rich shrine, according to the words of Stowe in his annals, was taken to the king's use, and the bones of St. Thomas by the command of Lord Cromwell were burned to ashes on, in September of 1538. The Catholic religion has covered the world with its superb monuments. Protestantism has now lasted 300 years. It was powerful in England and Germany, in America. What has it raised? It will show us the ruins which it has made, amidst which it has planted some gardens or established some factories. The Catholic religion is essentially a creative power, built up not to destroy, because it is under the immediate influence of the Holy Spirit, which the Church invokes as the creative spirit, creator spiritus. The Protestant or modern philosophical spirit is a principle of destruction, of perpetual decomposition and disunion. Under the dominion of English Protestant power, for 400 years Ireland is rapidly becoming as naked and void of ancient memorials as the wilds of Africa. The Reformers themselves were so ashamed of the progress of immorality among the proselytes, they could not help complaining about it against it. Thus spoke Luther, quote, Men are now more revengeful, covetous, and licentious than they ever were in the papacy. Then again, heretofore, when we were seduced by the Pope, every man willingly performed good works, but now no man says or knows anything else than how to get all to himself by exactions, pillage, theft, lying, and usury. Calvin wrote in the same strain. Of so many thousands, said he, who, renouncing popery, seemed eager to embrace the gospel. How few have amended their lives. Nay, what else did the greater part pretend to than by shaking off the yoke of superstition, to give themselves more liberty to follow all kinds of licentiousness? Dr. Halen, in his History of Reformation, complains also of the great increase of viciousness in England in the reforming reign of Edward VI. Erasmus says, quote, Take a view of this evangelical people, the Protestants. Perhaps tis my misfortune, but I never met, yet met with one who does not appear changed for the worst. End quote. And again, quote, Some persons, he says, whom I knew formerly innocent, harmless, and without deceit, no sooner have I seen them join to that sect, the Protestants, that they began to talk of wenches, to play at dice, to leave off prayers, being grown extremely worldly, most impatient, revengeful, vain like vipers, tearing one another. I speak by experience. End quote. M. Scherer, the principal of a Protestant school in France, wrote in 1844 that he beholds in his Reformed Church the ruin of all truth, the weakness of infinite division, the scattering of flocks, ecclesiastical anarchy, Socinianism, ashamed of itself, rationalism coated like a pill without doctrine, without inconstancy. This church, deprived alike of its corporation and its dogmatic character, of its form and of its doctrine, deprived of all that constituted a Christian church, has in truth ceased to exist in the ranks of religious communities. Its name continues, but it represents only a corpse, a phantom, or, if you will, a memory or a hope. For want of dogmatic authority, unbelief has made its way into three-fourths of our pupils. End quote. 
Such has been Protestantism from the beginning. It is written in blood and fire upon the pages of history, whether it takes the form of Lutheranism in Germany, Denmark, and Sweden, Anglicanism in Great Britain, or Calvinism and Presbyterianism in Switzerland, France, Holland, Scotland, and America. It has been everywhere the same. It has risen by tumult and violence, propagated itself by force and persecution, enriched itself by plunder, and has never ceased by open force, persecuting laws or slander, its attempt to exterminate the Catholic faith and destroy the Church of Christ, which the fathers of Protestantism left from the spirit of lust, pride, and covetousness, a spirit which induced so many of their countrymen to follow their wicked example, a spirit on account of which they would have been lost at all events, even if they had not left their mother, the one holy Catholic, Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. The main spirit of Protestantism, then, has always been to declare every man independent of the divine authority of the Roman Catholic Church and to substitute for this authority a human authority. Pope Pius IX spoke of this in all of its forms as a, quote, rejection against God, it being an attempt to substitute a human for divine authority, and a declaration of the creature's independence of the Creator. A true Protestant, therefore, says Mr. Marshall, does not acknowledge that God has a right to teach him, or if he acknowledges this right, he does not feel himself bound to believe all that God teaches him through those whom God appointed to teach mankind. He says to God, If thou teachest me, I reserve to myself the right to examine thy words, to explain them as I chose, and admit only what appears to me true, consistent, and useful. Hence, St. Augustine says, You who believe what you please, and reject what you please, believe yourselves or your own fancy rather than the gospel. The faith of the Protestant, then, is based upon his private judgment alone. It is human. As his judgment is alterable, says Mr. Marshall, he naturally holds that his faith and doctrine is alterable at will, and is therefore continually changing it. Evidently, then, he does not hold it to be the truth, for a truth never changes, nor does it hold to be the law of God, which he is bound to obey. For if the law of God be alterable at will, it can only be altered by God himself, never by man, any body of man, or any creature of God. Again, something for us to think about on this, the last Saturday of the liturgical year. I'll have something equally light for you tomorrow. People think Advent is a season of lightness and happiness and things, and it is. But if we are waiting the joyful return of our blessed Lord, or the joyful birth of our blessed Lord, to, to commemorate that birth, what does that mean? So tomorrow, tune in if you will. I have a very important homily from uh, one of the greatest priests and confessors in the history of the church. But that, all that having been said, I hope you found this useful today. Please pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.